I thank everybody. I'm going to work from left to right here. I'm just going to put diagrams on the board as part of a little experiment. We have noticed often that people engage much more with a series of diagrams on the board than they do with the slide deck, so we'll see how that works tonight. Um, how many of you know what peace looks like? This is actually kind of a problem that we have. Um, how many of you have heard the words peace and technology in the same sentence before? Not very common, but sometimes, okay. How about peace and technology and business all in the same sense? <laughs> okay, so um, there's this odd intersection of things, and um, what I want to talk about is, is what's become possible in the world uh, in the last 10 years, basically, due to technology, and, and that is now actually affecting business as well. Um, I'm going I'm to do this in the context of a concrete and, and controversial example, and I picked a controversial example on purpose, because I want you to see both the upside and the downside of these technology. Because these things are, are not 100% positive. They, they do measurably increase peace between certain communities. Um, but that comes with some price tags as well. It moves some conflict around to other places. And it has um, some negative externalities. And as a society, we have to determine uh, um, whether the benefits outweigh the, the, uh, the negative externalities or not. So I want to first talk about um, an, an, an engineering paradigm here that my colleagues from the Center for Design Research use. Um, in order to, uh, to do uh, design and engineering, first of all, you have to be able to observe a phenomenon. And we all sort of um, like pornography. We all sort of uh, know peace when we see it, but we, it, it isn't really well defined in many cases. And so the first challenge is here with, with peace is actually observing it and understanding what we observe. I'll give you a model for this in a moment. Um, once you can observe things, that allows you to instrument that phenomenon. If you can instrument it, that in turn allows you to uh, analyze. And if you can analyze well, that in turn allows you to intervene. And when we talk about peace technologies, we're trying to get here to actual technological interventions to measurably increase peace. Now, um, for most of human history, I want to suggest to you that one way to model what peace looks like, and I want you to think of it in terms of verbs, actions, behaviors. Um, there are a set of peaceful behaviors and um, they often have the general appearance of this. We have person A, we have, let me, let me draw them differently, uh, person B, and we have an episode of engagement between them. And that episode of engagement, historically, um, often takes the form of some of our old um, convening uh, uh, technologies, and notice that these are all um, exchanges of energy in some sense or other. We have person A might offer food or, or beverage or, or often alcoholic beverage. Don't, don't underestimate the effects of alcohol on these. Um, uh, it might also be in the form of um, warmth. We have spent thousands of years gathering around campfires together. It might be in the context of uh, shelter. And um, what you notice in, in many, many, many of these kinds of episodes of engagement, you see uh, people with group differences. And those differences, those group identities, sociologists refer to these as the big eight. How many of you want to guess at what some of those are? Things that our brains notice right away about, uh, about each other and how we're different from each other. So ethnicity or race is one obvious one, yes. Gender. Absolutely. Cosmologies. If you hang out often enough, yes. That tends to be seven or eight. If you have enough conversations, you notice worldview differences. That they might be um, either um, so either religious differences uh, or worldview or however you want to term that, uh, or, or uh, political orientation as well. Whether you, whether you are generally um, liberal or conservative. What about um, the age? Absolutely. The age is a very big one. Class. There are a couple of, so, um, in general, people would talk about socioeconomic status of some kind or other. But yes, class is one way of describing that. 
If I just put SES, does everybody know what that means? Socioeconomic status, okay. These are some of the big ones. There's a, there's a couple of other ones. There's a little bit of debate about what these are, but, but in general, there's a consensus that our brains are wired to notice um, big categories of difference like this right away. Okay, language, by the way, is another big one. Um, and then... Uh, How about intellect? Um, certainly there to some degree. You generally have to have a lot of interaction before you start picking that up with somebody. Um, but one of the other big ones that there's some consensus on is the survival of our species depends on noticing mating opportunities, and so we, we pay some sexual, some or, some uh, attention to sexual orientation. That's um, often one of the ones that occurs now. What I want you to notice about this old framework, and I'm trying to sketch a model for you that you can draw on the back of a napkin here when you talk to people and say, hey, this is what peace used to look like. What I want you to notice is we can observe this, and we also recognize it when we see it, that if person A offers shelter or warmth or food uh, to person B, we would all agree that that's a positive, peaceful behavior, right? They're not the only positive, peaceful behaviors we can give. There are a bunch of uh, more subtle ones. Before we usually get to this kind of an exchange, usually there's things like eye contact. There's things like um, 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 expression of openness or, or, or happiness. Or, or um, Then there might be language, a greeting, some sort of a, so forth. Each of these would be an episode. What I want you to see here is peace between person A and person B at its smallest level is going to look like a whole series, a whole chain of these episodes. And so if you get an episode from person A and then person B reciprocates that episode, now you have an interaction. If you follow that interaction over time, now you can model the relationship between person A and person B as a chain of interactions made up of a series of episodes. That's one way of modeling um, peace between these two people. Now you can look at their group identities, and if this person is male and this person is female, for example, if you have a whole bunch of other males and females and you can also look at their chains of interaction, now you can model the relationship between males and females. So what's interesting here, we can observe this. So here's the big change in the last decade is the world doesn't look like this anymore. This is the old model. And suddenly in the last decade, what has happened to most of our episodes of engagement? You're online. Online is close. Um, no one can tell you're a dog. <laughs> you're going in the right direction here. So we still have person A, right? But person A might have a device in their hand, they might be, have another device on their desk somewhere. Um, they might have some, you know, wearing some kind of Snapchat glasses or, whatever, or Google Labs. They might have something on their belt. Um, any number of different ways in which this person's behaviors are now instrumented. And of all the behaviors they can do that these instruments can pick up, some of those behaviors are social behaviors aimed at somebody else. And so suddenly, each of these things is connecting to a whole cloud of what we call mediating technologies. And there's a slight distinction there. Not quite the same as media, and not quite the same as mediated, mediated technology, but what these are is... Somebody give me some examples. Yes, Facebook is one. Facebook is one layer in this stack. Email. Email is another one. Skype is another one. Exactly. They're not just communication technologies. They're not just social media. Um, if you, how many of you used uh, Google Calendar to uh, put the laser talk on your on your calendar tonight? That was a mediating technology between you and Pierre. How many of you used Google Maps to get here? That was also a mediating technology between each of you and everybody else in this room. So. We're going to see in a moment that mediating technologies come in levels of quality in terms of the quality of engagement they enable between people. But you now have um, person B now might be where? Exactly. Be on the other side of the world, right? What's different about this picture than that picture? 
the big difference of the last decade is this. We basically built an external lab in the world and we've instrumented it. And we can now get a huge sample size of any two groups we care about. And we can look at episodes of mediated engagement. More and more of our human episodes of engagement are mediated. We can look at episodes of mediated engagement second by second, minute by minute, over huge sample sizes between almost any two groups we care about. Not everybody yet, but, but more and more people every day. The other thing, the first thing that's interesting about that is what happens to those group identities? It turns out that instrumentation helps us see that we have way more group identities than that. Anybody want to guess at, at a much higher resolution group identities? Exactly. Um, a whole lot of this, by the way, is bought and paid for by, by uh, the marketing business and the advertising business. Most of us um, belong to certain group identities. You know, I buy these jeans, not those jeans. Um, I wear a sweater. Some people don't. Um, you wear one kind of watch, I wear another kind of watch. I buy one kind of phone, you buy another kind of phone. Um, and these are actually high resolution group identities. They're not the only ones. But the thing is, we have data on a whole bunch of those. But what are some other ones? How many of you are parents? How many of you are parents of more than one kid? How many of you are parents of a boy and a girl? Each of these is a group identity. How many of you are parents of a boy of one age and a girl of another age? And, and whatever those ages were, that's another group identity. If your daughter happens to like pink Disney unicorns, that's another group identity. And you, as the parent of the daughter who likes pink as the unicorns now belong to that group identity. Do you see what I mean? We suddenly, these are quantifiable with high levels of precision group identities that were invisible a decade ago. And what's really interesting, there are a whole lot of people spending a whole lot of money trying to figure out the moment you're going to leave one of those groups and join another one. But those identities are not available back then. Exactly. They weren't available there at all. These are all new and novel. We couldn't see any of this before. Some of this, um, there were uh, more group identities that were visible then, but in fact we're, we're coming up with whole new categories of group identities that didn't exist until, until recently. So we have this ability, first of all, to see with much higher res resolution what our group identities are. We have this capability, secondly, to see more and more of our episodes of engagement that cross those group boundaries. And so what's novel about this world? Once we can instrument this, what do we get out of this? We get data like we have never, ever had before about every single episode of engagement. Because what do all of these technologies put out as a byproduct? They put out engagement data. Every time you send a text, every time you send an email, every time you view something on Facebook or like something or post a comment, and by the way, on any other platform too, I just use Facebook as an example. Um, and that engagement data usually has a bunch of your group identities attached to it and a bunch of somebody else's group identity attached to it. What that data does for the first time ever allows us to model the relationship between you and person B, whoever person B is. That modeling capability lets us simulate all the different things your relationship could be between person A and person B. All the different ways it could go, what some of the different interventions might be that would improve it. And that simulation capability lets us harvest the best interventions. There's a whole series of different intervention design possibilities here. And we can take those intervention designs and pile them right back into the stack. And what's really cool about these kind of experiments, by the way, that's just an experiment design. And the hypothesis is, if we, did, if we change the technology this way or that way, would it change the relationship between person A and person B in a positive way? And the answer is, now we can do thousands of these kinds of experiments. It's perfectly possible. And it's perfectly possible to see, sometimes within minutes, if it moves the needle on your relationship with any group you care about. So that's an intriguing new capability. If we now take those episodes of engagement and start looking at how to represent them, 
usually when people talk about peace, what they're talking about, if we put quality of uh, engagement on the vertical here, and here is zero quality of engagement, and here is negative quality of engagement, and if we put quantity of engagement on the horizontal from none to lots, being very specific here, um, typically what you notice when a relationship is going south between any two people, when a relationship is going south between any two groups, obviously what's happening is it's going south between a whole bunch of individual people from those groups. When you start charting that over time and you look at you know, something bad happens here at time one, and then something worse happens here at time two, and so forth, and you follow this down, and you, st you start seeing, in that scatter plot over time, you start seeing a trend line that you can abstract, and you can say, oh crap, this relationship is headed. By the way, this is a tightly constrained design space. If things keep going this way, sooner or later that engagement will terminate. One or both parties will destroy each other. That's how these things work. That's my attempt to draw a mushroom cloud. Um, by the way, I don't know if any of you noticed, the atomic uh, clock, uh, or the, the nuclear clock, the American Academy of Atomic Scientists. Do you remember the clock that used to tell us how close we are to nuclear zero that none of us have ever paid any attention to in the last decade or two? As of a few weeks ago, that clock is closer to zero than it has ever been. Don't know if you noticed that. At the same time, there is a little bit of good news in the world. How many of you are tracking the situation in Colombia? Uh, the modified peace treaty between the Colombian government and the FARC was signed by Parliament 75-0 unanimously. And what's historical about that? D-Day was last Friday. Disarmament Day started last Friday. I don't know if this peace will hold or not. We're, we're uh, quite active in that situation. But the Colombian War is the last war in the Western Hemisphere. And it just ended last week. And if that doesn't choke you up a little bit, something's wrong with you. But the fact that it's possible that we finish the last war in this hemisphere gives me hope for what we might do in the next hemisphere. And then at the same time, of course, we're cl closer again to nuclear Armageddon than we've ever been in 30 years. Um, here's what we typically mean by peace when we look at this. We usually mean, holy crap, we can see this trend line, we can see the direction it's going. Peace is intervening on this trend line somewhere and trying to drive things back in this direction. And implicitly, what we mean by peace when we talk about it this way is not war. And I want to suggest to you that this makes perfect sense, but when you follow that to its logical conclusion, you realize that what that means is, by that definition, peace is people ignoring each other. And that isn't very stable. It doesn't last very long. And in a world of 7 billion people going on 9 billion people, there's not a lot of hope for that staying stable. So there are a lot of people doing very good work in that space, by the way. In the literature, this is called negative peace. And negative peace, the research question here is, how can we get people to be less bad to each other? And it's an important question, especially when you have a crisis. In our lab, we don't work in this space very much, except by, by uh, second and third order effects. If you ask the question instead, how good can people be to each other? That gives you a whole new design space. And the first thing I want to say about this design space is, nobody knows yet. <laughs> it's a wide open design space compared to this one. What we do know is this space divides into two very interesting spaces. And you can basically look at um, qualities of buckets here of engagement. If you can elicit a tension between person A and person B, that attention enables you to start, sorry, awareness is the first one. That awareness enables you to start uh, directing attention between them. And what you see here is there are layers of enabling technology at each of these quality buckets as well. If you can do uh, attention really well, that enables you to start eliciting communication. If you can get communication between person A and person B, that in turn, gives you um, coordination, the ability to do coordination, which in turn gets you cooperation. I won't give you the tight definition of all of these at the moment, other than to say 
One of the great examples we have in our civilization of cooperation is that when you offend somebody, they no longer follow you down an alley and smash your kneecaps, they call their lawyer instead. What I want you to see here is cooperation is more intricate than most modern ballets, but nobody likes it except the lawyers. Um, here's where we see a very interesting phase shift. This is negative peace. This is positive but unstable peace. If you can get over this threshold to collaboration, and I mean something very specific by collaboration, our definition is mutual benefit in excess of the cost of engagement. If you can do that, you start generating new wealth up here, and that new wealth is quickly redistributed to both sides of this relationship boundary. And I, I'm running out of time here, but I want to give you a concrete example of what that looks like. And by the way, this is where our lab focuses. We work up these steps in order to get to this stuff. And one concrete but controversial example, and I, again, I'm using a controversial example on purpose. Anybody want to guess where I'm going? How many of you Ubered here tonight? Anybody? Am I the only one, really? How many of you took a ride-sharing service of some kind here tonight? How many of you are familiar with ride-sharing services? <laughs> okay, thank you. When you get in a car with a driver, Uber, I want you to think about this from here on out. Uber is a peace technology. Uber has enabled you and a complete stranger with a bunch of very different group identities from you to discover each other, to discover that you can create benefit for each other, to coordinate your activity, to get them to come find you and pick you up, to create benefit for each other that has an economic value, and that, by the way, is crucial and beautiful because that gives you scalable peace. And that economic value means that Uber enabled you to trust each other enough to get in the car, go for a ride, and in that seven minute drive, you can, we can measure exactly how much new wealth you were able to create for each other. You saved money, that driver made money, Uber made some money as well, and that gets reinvested in making the next episode even better. So Uber has amazing peace data, so do a bunch of other technologies, and if you want to find out about the controversies and the problems that go with that, and the costs that go with that, Piero will have to invite me back again for another talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>